Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaskar students and welcome to Swayam Prabha. I am Dr. Vageshwari Deswal, a professor of law at Delhi University. We are doing a course on Bharatiya Nyay Sahita 2023 Substantive Criminal Law. Today we will discuss lesson 13 which is Offenses Against Life Part 2. Students, in the previous lesson, we talked about what is culpable homicide and when it amounts to murder. We also started discussions regarding the exceptions to charges of murder. The first exception to charge of murder is grave and sudden provocation. For that, what is required is that there should be a grave provocation and the provocation should be sudden. It should be so grave as to deprive any ordinary person of control over self. And it should be so sudden that before the person gets time to cool down, he reacts because of that grave and sudden provocation and in that reaction the other person gets killed. So it is under those circumstances that an accused is eligible to claim the defense of grave and sudden provocation as a defense to charge of murder so as to entitle the accused to a partial exemption from criminal liability that is to reduce the charges of murder to culpable homicide of second degree. So, there are certain illustrations that are appended to section 101, exception 1. What are those illustrations? Illustration A. A. Under the influence of passion excited by a provocation given by Z, intentionally kills Y, Z's child. See, again I will read it. Here, killing is done by A. Provocation was given by Z. But now who has A killed? Y. Y is Z's child. Provocation came from Z but who was the target? Y. This is murder in as much as the provocation was not given by the child and death of child was not caused by accident or misfortune in doing an act caused by the provocation. See, provocation is given by one person so, defense of grave and sudden provocation is available only when you cause the death of the person from whom the provocation comes or in case someone else's death is caused that should be caused by accident or by mistake. But in the illustration given herein, what has A done? He has calculated that killing the child of this person who has given me provocation would be an even greater assault to that person. So here, if the accused has the capacity to think and contemplate how to take revenge for that grave and sudden provocation, it means that it was no longer a sudden provocation. The provocation might have been grave, but unless and until it is sudden, unless and until it is from the side of the deceased person, it would not be eligible as a defense. Now exception B, why gives grave and sudden provocation to A? A, on this provocation, fires a pistol at Y, neither intending nor knowing himself to be likely to kill Z who is near him, but out of sight. A kills Z. Here, A has not committed murder, but merely culpable homicide. Why? Because although the one who is killed is not the one from whom the grave and sudden provocation has come, but because it was done as an accident. He did not intend to kill Z. Okay. So, here the reaction 
of the accused was on account of that grave and sudden provocation and he did not intend to kill anyone else than the one who had provoked him. But some other person got killed but that was a result of an accidental act. So in such cases he would be eligible to claim the partial defense of grave and sudden provocation as an exemption to liability for murder and he would be responsible only for culpable homicide not for murder. Now illustration C. A is lawfully arrested by Z, a bailiff. A bailiff is an officer of court and if he has been asked to arrest a person, he will do that. So, A is lawfully arrested by Z, a bailiff. A is excited to sudden and violent passion by the arrest and kills Z. This is murder because the provocation was given by a thing done by a public servant in the exercise of his power. So, when a public servant is acting in the lawful exercise of his powers, you cannot say that I was provoked by the action of such public servant so as to make me eligible for availing the benefit of this exemption. Now, illustration D. A uh, appears as a witness before Z, a magistrate. Z says he does not believe a word of A's deposition and that A has perjured himself. See here what the magistrate says is I don't believe a word of what you have deposed, what you have testified and you have committed perjury. So A is moved to sudden passion by these words and kills Z. This is again murder because here again the provocation is given by a judge who was acting in the judicial exercise of his powers. So you cannot claim the benefit of this exemption in such cases. Then illustration E. A attempts to pull Z's nose. So here who is the aggressor? It is A because he is attempting to pull someone else's nose. Z in the exercise of right of private defense lays hold of A to prevent him from doing so. See here A is aggressor and Z is the one who gets the right of private defense. But A is moved to sudden and violent passion and consequence and kills Z. So this is murder in as much as the provocation was given uh, by a thing that was done in the exercise of right of private defense. Now illustration F. Z strikes B. B is by this provocation excited to violent rage. A. A bystander intending to take advantage of B's rage and to cause him to kill Z puts a knife into B's hand for that purpose. B kills Z with the knife. Here B may have only committed culpable homicide but A is guilty of murder. Because see A has done this act. Again when we will revise the entire previous lesson you have to see what amounts to culpable homicide, what amounts to murder. For culpable homicide what is required is that death of a human being, death to be, uh, uh, the act of accused to be the causal factor of death and the act to be done with the intention of causing death. Here what has A done? A has done an act of handing over a knife to a person whom he knew was in such a race that he was going to stab the other person to death. So here although the act was done by the other person but this act of handing over the knife was the causal factor of death, act resulted in death and the act was done by A with the intention of causing death. So A will not be eligible to any exemption whereas B would be eligible to the exemption of grave and sudden provocation. So these were certain illustrations to exception 1 to defense to charge of murder which is grave and sudden provocation. Now students let us move on to exception 2. Now what does exception 2 to the charge of murder say? Culpable homicide is not murder if the offender in the exercise in good faith of the right of private defense of person or property exceeds the power given to him by law and causes the death of the person against whom he is exercising such right of defense without premeditation, without any intention of doing more harm than is necessary for the purpose of such defense. So here what is required is that the act should be done in good faith. How do we ascertain the bona fides of a person? If the act of the accused is done in such a manner that we can see that due care and caution was exercised by the accused while doing that act. So then we can say that he has acted in good faith and in good faith the exercise should be of right of private defense of property. See private defense of property is available. 
to all persons in order to defend their own person as well as property against any kind of an assault. So, this private defense of person or property it even extends to voluntarily causing the death of the other person in certain circumstances. When you have acted within those lawful circumstances then it is a case which entitles an accused person to full exemption from criminal liability. But unless and until the case is covered under those conditions which entitle you to even cause the death of the aggressor nonetheless you have a right of private defense. But what you have done? You have exceeded your right of private defense. So, in such cases you do not get a total exemption from criminal liability, but still you get a partial exemption from criminal liability. So, uh, it is not murder if the offender in the exercise in good faith of the right of private defense of property exceeds the power given to him by law. And causes the death of the person against whom he is exercising such right of defense without premeditation and without any intention of doing more harm than is necessary. So, what this implies is that the person has exceeded the power, but he has exceeded the power only against the one against whom he was exercising such right of defense. It should not be a pre-planned thing, it should not be a deliberate or a calculated act to cause the death of the person taking the pretext of the aggression of the act of aggression. So, in case the person acts within the well defined limits by law, then the person would be entitled to a partial exemption from criminal liability by virtue of having exceeded the right of private defense. Here students what we have to be very careful about is that this is a defense which is never available to an aggressor. See you cannot take advantage of your own fault. If you commit aggression later on the other person proves to be a stronger opponent does not mean that you get the right of private defense now. If you were the aggressor the right of private defense would vest in the other person then you would not be eligible to this exemption. This is available only when an act of aggression is committed against the accused person. The accused has the right of private defense, but what the accused does? He exceeds the right of private defense because right of private defense is subject to certain limitations. That is the force which you use to repel the aggressor should not be grossly disproportionate to the force that you are threatened with. If the force which you use is grossly disproportionate, then it means you have exceeded your right of private defense and then in such cases exception 2 can be availed by the accused person. Now coming to the illustration, Z attempts to horse whip A, not in such a manner as to cause grievous hurt to A. So here who is the aggressor? Z and who is the purported victim? A here. So Z attempts to horse whip A, not in such a manner as to cause grievous hurt, but what does A do? He draws out a pistol. Now Z persists in the assault. So who has the right of private defense here? A. A believing in good faith that he can by no other means prevent himself from being horse whipped. He shoots Z dead. A has not committed murder here, but what he has committed is only culpable homicide. Why culpable homicide? Because although he had a right of private defense, but the assault that he was under the apprehension was was not of such a nature as to result in grievous hurt to him. So, despite not having such a high degree of threat of assault, what he does? He shoots that person which results in death. So, unless and until the assault was done with the intention of inflicting a grievous hurt on him here, he did not have the right to exercise private defense in full measure. Still if he does that, so what has he done? He has exceeded his right of private defense. He had the right of private defense in the first part, but because he has exceeded it, so now he is not eligible to full exemption from criminal liability, but still he is entitled to a partial defense which is available under exception 2 to section 101, which is a partial defense to charge of murder. So now it is no longer murder, but still it is culpable homicide. Exception 3, culpable homicide is not murder if the offender being a public servant or aiding a public servant acting for the advancement of public justice exceeds the powers given to him by law and causes death by doing an act which he in good faith believes to be lawful and necessary for the due discharge of his duty as such public servant and 
without ill will towards the person whose death is caused. So here what has been done is by a public servant, so the offender was either a public servant or he was aiding a public servant. What were they doing? They were acting for the advancement of cause of public justice. But what they have done? They have exceeded the powers given to them by law. And what they have done is they have caused death. But then again, see, if a public servant exceeds his powers and causes death of a person, now what happens? He would be liable for murder. But here, the public servant is excused from charges of murder and only convicted for culpable homicide. Why? Because the public servant was acting in advancement of public justice and he did an act in good faith. See, after exercising due care and precaution, the public servant did an act which he in good faith believed to be lawful and necessary for due discharge of his duty as such public servant. Another thing that is very important is here is that he should not have acted with any malice towards the person whose death is caused. So there should be an absence of ill will. So the act should be done without ill will. But still, even if he is a public servant and he has caused the death of a person by exceeding the powers that are given to him under law, he would be guilty for culpable homicide. Then exception 4. Culpable homicide is not murder. If it is committed without premeditation in a sudden fight, in the heat of passion upon a sudden quarrel and without the offender having taken undue advantage or acting in a cruel or unusual manner. So what exception 4 talks about is the exception of sudden fight. See what is the difference between exception 1 which is grave and sudden provocation and exception 4 which is sudden fight. See in exception 1 the provocation is unilateral. In exception 4, sudden fight, the provocation is from both the sides, it is bilateral. See what happens in a fight, obviously it is started by one person, but the subsequent conduct of the other person puts him in an equally blameworthy position. So what happens, none of the parties exercises any restraint, in a fight it escalates to a level that eventually one person gets killed. So now both the parties are equally to be blamed for escalation of that quarrel to such an extent. So now what happens? The one who loses the life dies. The other person who survives gets the benefit of this exception. Why does he get the benefit of this exception? Because it was on account of the other party's role also that he finds himself in such a position that he eventually ended up killing the other person. Another thing what is important here is that the fight should be sudden. It should not be premeditated. It should not be planned. And then again, it just kept on escalating, tempers, they kept on rising, eventually one person got killed. But again, what is important here and to avail the benefit of this exemption is that the accused should not have acted in an unusually barbaric or cruel manner. See, we have to see it from the facts and circumstances. The accused should not have taken this as a pretext to, to settle some old scores or just as an excuse to orchestrate a killing against someone whom he wanted to kill. So in case that is present, then the charges would be for murder. But if it was a sudden fight, on the spur of the moment, the, flight, uh, the fight, it took such enormous proportions. Then in such cases, what have, happens? The one who survives gets the benefit of this exemption, provided the accused did not take advantage of the situation or cause death of the deceased by acting in an unusually cruel or barbaric manner without taking undue advantage of the situation. See, it is immaterial in such cases which party offers the provocation or commits the first assault because irrespective of who started the fight, subsequently it is to be seen that both the parties are equally at fault. None of them exercised even a minimum degree of restraint due to which the fight could have been controlled. So what happens? They are both equally to be blamed. So this is what is sudden fight and this is how it is different from grave and sudden provocation which is exception 1. Now coming to exception 5, culpable homicide is not murder when the person whose death is caused being above the age of 18 years suffers death or takes the risk of death with his own consent. See in our country euthanasia, mercy killing that is not permitted. Okay. But exception 5 
provides a condition wherein see if a person who is an adult above 18 years of age the other person has taken the risk of death see as per the law no one is supposed to play god you cannot take anyone else's life birth and death they are not matters to be decided by us humans so what happens even if the other person is asking you to kill that person and you go ahead and kill that person liability would still be yours but it would be only for culpable homicide if the person who has asked you to kill himself or herself is one who is above 18 years of age then in such cases charges would be for culpable homicide but if the person is below 18 years of age a minor who is incompetent to decide for himself or herself what is good or what is not good for such a person then in such cases even if the other person had voluntary consented to that risk still if you cause the death of that person the charges would be for murder not for culpable homicide. See there was a case in which a woman she lost her only child and she was so sad she was beyond uh, herself with grief she would keep crying all the time she would uh, keep begging her husband that please kill me I don't want to live anymore and she was actually quite serious about it that please I don't want to live anymore one day the husband killed her and then he ran away along with the weapon of offense and all when he was apprehended all the facts they were narrated and it was established that yes it was the woman who had voluntarily taken that risk and due to which the man he had killed her so this would was a case which would be covered under culpable homicide it would not amount to murder it would have amounted to murder if the woman was below 18 years of age okay so this is it now there is an illustration a by instigation voluntarily causes z a child to commit suicide a child is a person below 18 years of age so here this exception would not be available here on account of Z's youth, he was incapable of giving consent to his own's death. A has therefore abetted murder. So students, I hope these five exceptions to uh, section 101, that is exceptions to charge of murder are clear. Now again, I'll just repeat that these exceptions, they uh, entitle an accused to a partial exemption from criminal charge. See, whenever a case comes before us in which there is a death of a human being. So what are we supposed to see? Whether it is a culpable homicide or not. So what we have to see is there should be death of a human being, death should be caused, death should be caused by another human being and the act of accused should be directly responsible for the death of the deceased person. Okay. After that, we then proceed to see under which of the clauses of section 100 does the case fall that is was the act done with the intention of causing death was it done with the intention of inflicting a bodily injury that was likely to cause it or was it done with the intention or with the knowledge not with intention but with knowledge that the act will result in death so depending upon the clause of section 100 in which the case falls then we proceed to examine it as per the corresponding clauses given under section 101 that is 299 1 300 1 the old ones now it is section 100 section 100 and 1 so clause a of 101 and section 100 firstly the hypothetical distinction which we draw in the previous lesson so if a case is covered under section 100 clause 1 or in section 101 any of the clauses of section 101 because what 101 talks about is murder so whenever a case is covered under either only section 100 clause 1 which means automatically that it is covered under 101a or even if it is covered under any of the uh, any of the clauses that is of section 101 which could be clause b c or d so this is a case of murder that is culpable homicide of highest degree whenever there is a case which falls under the clause 2 of section 100 or also under any of the clauses of section 101 along with any of the exceptions to section 101 then it is a case which is culpable homicide of second degree so for culpable homicide of second degree what we have to see is either there is a case which is covered only under section 100 clause 2 and it is not covered under any of the clauses of section 101 or if it is covered under any of the clauses of section 101 it should also be covered under any of the exceptions to uh, section 101 so as to entitle the accused to a partial exemption from the charges of murder 
if the case is covered only under section 100 clause 2 or it is covered under any of the clauses of section 101 plus any of the exceptions then this is only a culpable homicide of second degree then it would not be murder it would be culpable homicide of second degree. Now what is culpable homicide of third degree that is when a case is covered only under clause 3 of section 100 when it is not covered under any of the clauses of section 101 because 101 is talking about murder. So if a case is covered under murder any of the clauses of section 101 plus the exceptions so we reduce the liability by only one degree that is culpable homicide of third of second degree. Culpable homicide of third degree is only in those cases when the case is covered under clause 3 of section 100. Now there is another provision given under the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita section 102 which talks about the doctrine of transfer of malice. What is doctrine of transfer of malice? See this is an English doctrine which is also popularly known as doctrine of transmigration of malice in which injury which was intended for one person falls upon another person. So what do we presume in law? that the malice which was intended for one person has been transferred to the other person. See what does section 102 of BNS say? It says culpable homicide by causing death of person other than person whose death was intended. So if a person by doing anything which he intends or knows to be likely to cause death commits culpable homicide by causing the death of any person whose death he neither intends nor knows himself to be likely to cause. The culpable homicide committed by the offender is of the description of which it would have been if he had committed the death of the person whose death he intended or knew himself to be likely to cause. So students, we have already discussed that culpable homicide is of three descriptions. What are those three descriptions? See if a case is covered only under section 100 not under 101 then it is merely culpable homicide. If a case is covered under 100 and also covered under section 101 then it is culpable homicide amounting to murder. If a case is covered under 100 also covered under 101 and then also being covered under exceptions to section 101 then it is culpable homicide not amounting to murder. So you see culpable homicide not amounting to murder, culpable homicide amounting to murder and culpable homicide which could be of first degree, second degree or third degree. So these three degrees are essential to understand in order to determine the criminality attached to a crime and in order to determine the punishment to which the accused would be eligible for. So here what the law says is that if a person by doing anything which he intends or knows to be likely to cause death commits culpable homicide. See it is not saying commit culpable homicide amounting to murder or not amounting to murder because when we talk about culpable homicide then it would be something which may amount to murder which may not amounting to murder depending upon the facts and circumstances of each and every case this is something which the courts are supposed to decide. But then what is required is that a person causes the death of another person he either intended to cause the death or he knew that death would be caused and in furtherance of such intention or knowledge the person does that act to kill someone but what happens someone other than the intended person dies. So what the law says that you would still be held responsible. There is a very famous case Mushnuru Suryanara and Murthy's case in which what had happened the accused he had drawn large sums of insurance on his friend's life. And now he be became greedy and he wanted to get that money. So what he did, he invited his friend over to his house to have food with him. And then what he did, he poisoned a sweet meat, a sweet uh, halwa that he was preparing for his friend. He put some poison in it and he offered it to his friend to eat. The intention was that the person would eat the halwa, he would die and then the money of that insurance would, the payout would be coming to him. This person who was served the sweet meat, he did not like the taste. So he let, ate a little bit of that and he threw the remaining portion away. So when he kept the remaining portion aside, what happened? That there were two girls in the house who were the knees of the accused person. One of the girls picked up that halwa, she ate a portion herself, she gave some portion to her friend. And what happened? Those two girls, they died, whereas the one who was intended to be killed, he did not die. Okay. 
So now in this case, what is the responsibility of the accused person? See, and what is the responsibility of the one to whom the halwa was served to be eaten? Now the one to whom the sweet meat was given, had he known that this is poisoned, and if then he had given it specifically to that girls to be consumed, he would also be a guilty partner in crime. But here he was not aware that the halwa was poisoned. He did not like the taste, so he just kept it aside. Accidentally, those girls, they picked it up and they ate it. Liability would still be on part of the first accused person who had prepared that halwa by putting poison in it. Why would he be responsible? Because he, his act has resulted in death. The act was done with the intention of causing death. Although intention was to kill his friend, but who has died is his niece. But what does law require? Law requires death of a human being. Act of accused to be the causal factor of death and the act of accused should be done with the intention of causing death. All the conditions are satisfied, so the accused was held guilty for murder of those girls. So this is how the law applies. Now coming to section 103, which gives punishment for murder. What does the law say? Whoever commits murder shall be punished with death or imprisonment for life and shall also be liable to fine. So students, what are the cases that are covered under charges of murder? Section 101, either of the clauses of section 101, but not the exceptions appended thereto. So when the case of an accused is covered under section 101, or even if it is covered under section 100, clause 1, which is identical to 101A, so that is a charge of murder for which the punishment would be death or imprisonment for life. There is a discretion with the courts. The judges may either award life imprisonment or they may award death sentence. Now 103 clause 2, this is a new addition to the BNS. This was not earlier there when the Britishers enacted the Indian Penal Code. Now this is a new provision which has been introduced in the law by virtue of recommendations given by Supreme Court in Tehseen Punawala's judgment, wherein the Supreme Court had specifically recommended that Parliament may create a special law against mob lynchings. So, Section 103 Clause 2 takes care of mob lynchings, hate crimes, honor killings. See, these are crimes which have always been taking place in the society and people, they wanted a separate law in this. So when we had this opportunity of overhauling our laws, one clause was introduced in section 103, clause 2, and now this is something which takes care of charges of mob lynchings, uh, hate crimes, honor killings, anything which is done by five or more than five people. Although we already had a provision, section 149 in the old Indian Penal Code, and we also had section 34 dealing with common intention. So we had common intention. We had crimes committed in furtherance of common object for which joint liability was imposed under 149. But now we have a more specific law to deal with such mob lynchings or to deal with crimes which are committed by large group of numbers because see what happens, people they draw strength from numbers. So they commit more heinous crimes when there is a large group of people involved. So what the law says, irrespective of the part that was played by either one of them, liability would be the same for all of them. Because see, nobody is above the law and everybody should know that you cannot escape the law in case you commit these kind of crimes. So what does clause 2 say? It says when a group of 5 or more persons, so what is required is a minimum of 5 people who are acting conjointly as a group. So what it says when a group of 5 or more persons acting in concert commits murder on the ground of race, caste or community, sex, place of birth, language, personal belief or any other similar ground, each member of such group shall be punishable with death or with imprisonment for life and shall also be liable to fine. So you see this is such an important addition in the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita to take charge over the crimes that are committed by people in large groups. So now they cannot escape punishment and it is something for which we expressly have a provision which punishes it as equivalent to premeditated pre-planned murders. Now coming to section 104, 
which deals with punishment for murder by life convict. See in IPC we have had section 303. Now 303 was struck down by the Supreme Court of India in Mithu versus State of Punjab. It's an old case but why was it struck down? Because what 303 provided was mandatory death penalty. So now there have been a correction in this law and now there is no more a mandatory death penalty. We have retained the provision but we have changed the language. Now what does 104 say? Whoever being under sentence of imprisonment for life commits murder shall be punished with death or with imprisonment for life. So you see now there is a discretion with the courts that is depending upon the facts of the case if they feel that the aggravating factors are more there then in such cases they may even award a death penalty but if they feel that no this is not a fit case for award of death penalty then it would be imprisonment for life which shall mean the remainder of that person's natural life. Now section 105 punishment for culpable homicide not amounting to murder. See punishment for murder is provided under 103 already. Now coming to punishment for culpable homicide not amounting to murder. So this is a section which deals with punishment for culpable homicide of second degree as well as culpable homicide of third degree. For culpable homicide of first degree which is murder punishment is there in section 103. What 105 says is whoever commits culpable homicide not amounting to murder shall be punished with imprisonment for life or imprisonment of either description for a term which shall not then be less than 5 years but which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine if the act by which death is caused is done with the intention of causing death or of causing such bodily injury as is likely to cause death. So this would be see if death is caused with the intention of causing death it means it's a case of murder but still why are we penalizing this person for culpable homicide not amounting to murder is because the accused case would also be covered under any of the exceptions. What happens in such cases the liability is partially reduced and now he would be responsible for culpable homicide of second degree or causing such bodily injury as is likely to cause death. So now in these two this is culpable homicide of second degree and then or with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and with fine if the act is done with knowledge that it is likely to cause death but without any intention to cause death or cause such bodily injury as is likely to cause death. So it is a case which was covered under 100 clause 3. This is culpable homicide of third degree. So this is not covered under any other clause of section 100 or section 101 and that is why this is culpable homicide of third degree. So you see there is the highest penalty for culpable homicide of first degree which is murder. There is a slighter lesser penalty for culpable homicide of second degree and there is even a lesser penalty for culpable homicide of third degree and that is why we need to draw these distinctions of degree so as to understand how the law operates to penalize those who are convicted for killing other human beings. So after uh, culpable homicide and murder now we move to another act of killing which is also penalized under the law but not to the same extent and that is causing death by negligence section 106. See negligence is also one of the degrees of mens rea intention is the highest degree after that comes knowledge and thereafter comes negligence. Negligence is characterized by an inadvertent thoughtlessness when a person does not, does not exercise the due degree of care and precaution which the accused is expected to exercise. And when there is a higher degree of negligence that is when there is a mental indifference to an obvious risk that is something which counts as rashness. In many cases a very high degree of rashness might be equated with knowledge so as to make the accused punishable not for causing death by negligence and rashness but for culpable homicide not amounting to murder which could be covered under section 100 clause 3. So what 106 says is whoever causes death of any person by doing any rash or negligent act 
not amounting to culpable homicide. See here what is important is death should be caused of any person. The death should be caused by either a rash act or a negligent act. That is when the accused does not exercise the due degree or precaution that any person is expected to exercise in normal and reasonable circumstances. And further what is important is that such rash or negligent act should not amount to culpable homicide. What that means is that it should not have the degree of a higher degree of mens rea. It should not have knowledge or intention to inflict an injury that was likely to cause death. If it is covered under knowledge or intention then the case would cover under section 100 or section 101. It is only those cases wherein death has been caused but not on account of intention or knowledge on part of the accused person. Then in such cases death was still attributable to the act of accused person. Then we invoke section 106. So death of a person is caused by doing any rash or negligent act and the act does not amount to culpable homicide shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to five years and shall also be liable to fine. See earlier this uh, provision was section 304A causing death by negligence in IPC but now it is 106 and the punishment it has been extended to five years. Earlier it provided a maximum punishment of two years. Further uh, if such act is done by a registered medical practitioner, so now this is also an addition in the law. If such act is done by a registered medical practitioner while performing medical procedure, he shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to two years and shall also be liable to fine. See ordinarily negligence is something for which a person is uh, uh, supposed to pay compensation under the civil law. Criminal negligence is very difficult to be proven but when we talk about criminal negligence and especially when we talk about doctors, so the degree of mens rea required to constitute criminal negligence that has to be established, we have to be mindful of the fact that this provision it should not be misused against doctors. So that is why although we have this provision but this is to be read in the light of Supreme Court judgment given in 2005 in the case of Jacob Matthew versus State of Punjab in which the courts had said that we need to exercise caution while holding doctors guilty of criminal negligence. So the same safeguards would apply despite having the new law. Then what it says for the purposes of this subsection registered medical practitioner means a medical practitioner who possesses any medical qualification recognized under the National Medical Commission Act 2019 and whose name has been entered in the National Medical Register or a State Medical Register under the Act. Further, there is clause 2 of section 106 which is a very contentious provision over which there have been strikes also uh, committed uh, uh, by the truckers lobby and this is one single provision whose implementation has been put on hold for the time being while the rest of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita 2023 has been notified to be implemented with effect from 1st July 2023, this particular provision we still await a date for its implementation. See what does the provision say? It says whoever causes death of any person by rash and negligent driving of vehicle not amounting to culpable homicide. See what is to be seen here, the act should not be done with the intention or with the knowledge, it should be a rash or negligent act of driving due to which death has been caused and one, the one who has caused the death by such driving accident escapes without reporting it to a police officer or a magistrate soon after the incident shall be punished with imprisonment for either description of a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. So there was a very high degree of punishment that has been prescribed for these hit and run cases. See as per the NCRB data of 2021, people who were killed on account of hit and run cases are higher in numbers as compared to those who were killed by murders. So this is a very timely intervention. We needed a law but then again uh, the uh, contentious clause herein is without reporting it to a police officer or a magistrate. 
See, truck drivers, they have to spend long hours on the road, so their concerns are also not totally unfounded. They are concerned that because if they suppose an accident happens, and if they are to stop there, if they are supposed to inform the authorities, maybe there would be a mob gathering there and there could be instances of mob lynching on, against them or their vehicles. So in such cases, they have to flee from the spot. So that is their concern. But then if we will read uh, Bharatiya Nagrik Suraksha Sahita, it has specifically introduced provisions for registration of EFIR, registration of zero FIR. So maybe if our truckers are more technologically aware, they can resort to filing of EFIRs and thus their concerns could be allayed. But then again, maybe our legislators, they also need to rethink on the quantum of punishment that has been prescribed because see, there is not an intentional act, there is not a, a knowledge present in such cases, but obviously there is a negligence and a rashness. And what this law imposes is a duty. This is an obligation which is a moral obligation was always there. By this provision now there is a legal obligation that see if there is someone whom you have wounded, if you have hurt someone. So take some sort of precaution to either inform the authorities, get some help for the person. Okay. So because what happens that golden hour rule. Many crucial lives, they can be saved if information is provided to the authorities in a on time. That was the objective behind this law. Now moving further, section 107, it talks about abetment of suicide of child or person of unsound mind. See, when we are talking about a child, when we are talking about persons of unsound mind, now these are persons who are not totally aware of the nature and circumstances of their actions. So sometimes it is possible that they were not totally aware and they have been uh, asked to do, they have been abetted to do something which was grossly detrimental to them. So this is exploitation of dependencies. This amounts to a very, very heinous act in which you've caused a person who was incapable of knowing what is good or what is bad for him to take away his own life. So that would be abetment of suicide of a child or abetment of a suicide of a person of unsound mind. So what this law says, if any child, any person of unsound mind, any delirious person or any person in a state of intoxication commits suicide, whoever abets the commission of such suicide shall be punished with death or imprisonment for life or imprisonment for a term not exceeding 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. So anybody taking advantage of such a situation wherein a person is intoxicated or delirious or uh, is a child and if you take advantage of the situation to the detriment of that person that causes the person to lose his life, so that is something which is heavily punishable under the law. Then abetment of suicide. Okay. If any person commits suicide, whoever abets the commission of such suicide shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. See, abetment of suicide is expressly punishable under the law. Then coming to attempt to murder. See, an attempt to commit a crime is also a crime. Why is it a crime? Because see, when a person intends to commit a crime, plans to commit a crime and then does any act towards the commission of the crime, the crime will take place. But what if the crime doesn't take place due to some supervening circumstances? Nonetheless, an attempt to crime, commit the crime has been constituted. See, when you have an intention preparation and you do any act towards the commission of the crime, if you succeed, it amounts to a crime. If you don't succeed, it is still an attempt. Now the remaining, uh, now the important part here is why did the attempt not succeed? Was it because of your own folly or because of some supervening circumstances? If it was because of circumstances beyond your control due to which your attempt which otherwise had it allowed to continue, had it been allowed to take place on its own, it would have definitely resulted in the forbidden consequences. But your attempt was frustrated, why? Because of some circumstances which were beyond your control. Still, it is an attempt to commit a crime for which you have to be punished under the law. What 109 talks about is attempt to murder. What does the law say? Whoever 
does any act with such intention or knowledge and under such circumstances that if he by that act caused death, he would be guilty of murder, shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. And if hurt is caused to any person by such act, the offender shall be liable either to imprisonment for life or to such punishment as is herein before mentioned. And when any person offending under subsection 1 is under sentence of imprisonment for life, he may if hurt be caused, that is if a person is already undergoing a sentence for imprisonment and then he attempts to commit murder because of which hurt is caused to any person, then in such cases the accused shall be punished with death or with imprisonment for life which shall mean the remainder of that person's natural life. There are certain illustrations appended to section 109 to further clarify the situation. What it says? A shoots at Z with intention to kill him under such circumstances that if death ensued, A would be guilty of murder. A is liable to punishment under this section. Next. A with the intention of causing the death of a child of tender years exposes it in a desert place. A has committed the offence defined by this section though the death of the child does not ensue. See if the de death of the child took place it would amount to murder but since the death has not taken place it is nonetheless an attempt to commit murder. Illustration C. A intending to murder Z buys a gun and loads it. A has not yet committed the offence. A fires the gun at Z. He has committed the offence defined in the section and if by such firing he wounds Z, he is liable to the punishment provided by latter part of subsection 1. A intending to murder Z by poison purchases poison and mixes the same with food which remains in A's keeping. A has not yet committed the offence defined in this section. A places the food on Z's table or delivers it to Z's servant to place it on Z's table. Now what has he done? He has committed an attempt to murder, something which is defined under section 109. 110, it talks about attempt to commit culpable homicide. So what does 110 say? Whoever does any act with such intention or knowledge and under such circumstances that if he by that act caused death, he would be guilty of culpable homicide not amounting to murder. Culpable homicide not amounting to murder means the case would be covered only under clause 2 or clause 3 of section uh, 100 or if it was covered under clause A also of section 100 or under any of the clauses of section 101, then it would also be covered under any of the exceptions to section 101 because those were the cases, those would be the cases when it would be the culpable homicide of second degree or third degree. So what does section 110 say? It says whoever does any act with such intention or knowledge and under such circumstances that if he by that act caused death, he would be guilty of culpable homicide not amounting to murder, then he shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 3 years or with fine or with both. And if hurt is caused to any person by such act, shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 7 years or with fine or with both. So you see attempt to commit murder, attempt to commit culpable homicides, these have been expressly declared to be specific crimes under the law. Even otherwise we have a general provision relating to attempts wherein all attempts to commit a crime are also punishable, are also deemed to be criminal acts. Illustration to section 110, what it says? A. On grave and sudden provocation, fires a pistol at Z. Under such circumstances that if he thereby caused death, he would be guilty of culpable homicide not amounting to murder. So A has committed the offence defined under this section. So students, now we will talk about 
a new provision which has been introduced in the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita which is related to organized crimes which has been defined under section 111 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita. It says any continuing unlawful activity. So here what is the important term is continuing unlawful activity including. So this is an inclusive definition. Okay? This is merely illustrative. This is not an exhaustive list. What does the law say? Any continuing unlawful activity including kidnapping, robbery, vehicle theft, extortion, land grabbing, contract killing, economic offense, cyber crimes, trafficking of persons, drugs, weapons or illicit goods or services, human trafficking for prostitution or ransom, by any person or a group of persons acting in concert, singly or jointly. See, when we talk about organized crime, what is important is one, there has to be an unlawful activity and second, it should be a continuing unlawful activity. Then what comes next is, it should be done by a person or by a group of persons acting in concert, singly or jointly, either as a member of an organized crime syndicate or on behalf of such syndicate by use of violence, usage of threat, by use of violence, intimidation, coercion or by any other unlawful means to obtain direct or indirect material benefit including a financial benefit shall constitute organized crime. So students this was the definition of organized crime and it is not for the first time that we've got a law against organized crime. We've got so many state legislations dealing with organized crimes but what we were lacking so far was a central legislation that could deal with organized crimes. See section 111 of the BNS in relation to organized crime it borrows heavily from the Maharashtra control of organized crime act which has been extended to New Delhi in 2002 and the Gujarat Control of Organized Crime Act, Andhra Pradesh in 2001, Arunachal Pradesh in 2002, Karnataka in 2000, Telangana in 2001 and Uttar Pradesh in 2017 have enacted acts which are identical to the Maharashtra and Gujarat Control of Organized Crimes Act. Further, Haryana in 2020 and Rajasthan in 2023 have also introduced similar bills on organized crimes. So despite having so many state legislations, now we have enacted a central legislation. Why? Because there were many states which did not have these acts. So now the question is, would there be jurisdictional issues? Since we have a separate law at the state level, we have a separate law at the central level. So. Article 254 of the constitution clarifies that in cases of repugnancy central law will prevail. So now in case there is any conflict between the state law and the central law, it is the central law section 111 which will now prevail. For the purposes of this section, this section further defines what is an organized crime syndicate, what amounts to continuing unlawful acti, what is an economic offense. So students you can see all these definitions in the slide that is in front of you. The definition has been given by the law itself. And then further what is the punishment for organized crime that is given under clause 2, clause 3, clause 4 that is if you are a member of an organized crime syndicate, when the organized crime has resulted in the death of a person or whatever is being done by that organized crime syndicate as a group, what would be the punishment that would be prescribed for that has already been given in the law and that is something which you can see on the slide in front of you. So students. That will be all for this lesson. We discussed what are the exceptions to culpable homicide and amounting to murder. We also discussed what amounts to causing death by a rash and negligent act, what is attempt to murder, attempt to commit culpable homicide and what is an organized crime. In the next class, we will continue with what amounts to petty organized crime, what amounts to a terrorist act and various other crimes under offenses against life. So that will be all for this lesson. Thank you.